Justice Rand here. I am uh, the lead architect of Stash Crypto and a uh, community open Bitcoin privacy project. Uh, been involved in Bitcoin since uh, 2010, joined the Bitcoin Talk forums. And uh, as a result, I've seen uh, I've seen this uh, block size argument from the perspective of it being a four or five year long running debate. Uh, you know, it's coming to a head now, but it has long roots, and we'll go over some of those briefly. Uh, the, the particular question I would like to address is the idea of multiple full node implementations on the network, which is a debate that's been running even longer than the block size debate. Like the debate about whether or not we would have multiple implementations started before the idea of not scaling became an idea. So um, the, the, the basic problem with Bitcoin is that we're trying to build a new form of money, which is a ledger that everybody agrees on. So when you're using software to build a ledger, you have this technical problem of every piece of software that uh, is part of this network has to come to the exact same agreement about the state of the ledger, and specifically, whether a block is valid or not. You know, we have blocks, they contain transactions, the transactions have an embedded scripting language. Every implementation must come to the exact same conclusion regarding rejecting invalid transactions and invalid blocks, and accepting the valid ones. Uh, when, when this doesn't happen, we have a consensus failure. You know, uh, consensus failures, um, there's pretty much there's, there's two ways you can think of a consensus failure. There can be a software bug, as in the software has failed to uh, exhibit the behavior intended by the programmer, which it, anybody, I think there's some people in here who have been involved with the software industry at some point, possibly, you know, and out of one that set of people in the room, some of you may have encountered situations where your programs did not perform as intended. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's happened. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a fact of life. You know, software does not, uh, it's not perfect. So one of the ways in which uh, we can have a consensus fair between nodes is that there's just a bug in the software. And contributing to that is that uh, it's even harder for software to exhibit the intended behavior when the programmer isn't really clear about what the intended behavior is. So um, poorly specified uh, software tends to poorly uh, conform to the intentions. You know, if you don't know precisely what you want the software to do in all conditions, it's hard to make sure it does. And uh, this, uh, these kind of failures, they are possible even when there is only one software implementation on the network. And uh, the example I gave here is the, the most famous example that happened in Bitcoin, March 11th of 2013. Uh, we discovered a new emergent property of Bitcoin Core in that uh, the, the pre-level DB versions had database behavior that no one really knew about. And uh, we saw a case where uh, different nodes uh, in a runtime state dependent way would uh, fail to accept valid blocks or would fail to accept blocks that all of the humans using the system would have expected were valid. And uh, it was, it's, uh, the issue is cloudy in that um, there was a new version of Bitcoin Core which did not exhibit the bug. But even, there was even disagreement between old unupgraded versions because you know, the, the, whether or not the database would run out of blocks was runtime dependent. So you could have a case where if you had identical hardware, an identical software version, complete completely identical uh, runtime software in every way, if one node had been on lo run longer, or if it just had a different view of the network and it seemed more orphans, and so its database was in a different state, there was a possibility of a fork based on that. So what we learned in uh, 2013 is that there is no way to reduce the risk of consensus failure to zero, even if everyone runs the exact same code. So that's this is a very important point that is often uh, just kind of brushed over in the discussion of uh, you know, multiple implementations and the associated risks. We're so aware that we can opt for it. Yeah. So the, the second example we have is very recent. It was just featured in an article uh, on Bitcoin Magazine. Uh, the Ethereum network uh, started from the beginning with multiple implementations. And according to their 
uh, you get you know choose your client web page. I counted eight implementations that they have. Uh, Ethereum just recently had a problem where two of their eight implementations were improperly processing scripts, and so uh, that was causing big problems on the network because they were the two uh, the two implementations that had the most usage. But uh, what we saw in that case is that Ethereum continued to function because um, the, the fraction of the network that exhibited the bug was a minority, and so the, the, run, the people who used that node were able to uh, get a, a software update as soon as it was available, and the network continued to run. And so this kind of brings us to this idea of the, the uh, risk-adjusted impact of consensus failures. So uh, the, the impact starts at some positive value with one implementation, because we can never reduce the risk to zero. There's always a possibility that uh, we will have consensus failures. It increases as we go up towards two implementations, and it actually reaches a maximum point. The, uh, the worst possible consensus failure is when just under half of the network forks away from the other half, and now you have two equal forks, and depending on the type of consensus failure, if, if you're talking about some esoteric uh, you know, interpretation of some non-standard script, there might not even be an obvious solution. So that's, that's your worst case scenario. But as the number of implementations increases, the, uh, the fraction of the network that would be affected gets gradually smaller, and so the obviousness of the solution becomes greater. And uh, this says number of implementations, but more specifically, what this should be is the, uh, the reciprocal of the market share of the dominant implementation. So what this is saying is when the dominant implementation has half of the uh, half of the network share, that's when you're at most risk. And as it drops, as the dominant implementation drops to a third, a quarter, a fifth, your, uh, your risk goes down accordingly. So when it comes to the case of should we have, uh, should we have multiple implementations running on the network and mining, the answer is yes, but it needs to be three or more. Really, we need to go. We need to go from one to three as quickly as possible to get over the risk hump, and then from there on, uh, you know, smooth sailing, the more the merrier. Um, and you know, there, knowing that there are uh, there are ways to reduce the risk of a fork. Uh, what we're using now, what's the the standard that's been in place since 2013, since Bitcoin Core's you know major fork was, we'll just be really careful. And I mean that that is you have to do that anyway. Good software engineering practices, lots of testing. Um, of course, you have to do that. But uh, I, I wanted to bring up a quote. So you see, this is from November twelfth of twenty twelve. This is when the multiple implementation debate really, uh, really heated up. Um, and you can look up this thread. The thread is you know announcing the code availability of this approved supernode. Bits of Proof was the first serious attempt to make a full stack re-implementation that would mine. It was written in Java. And this is also the last time in history that the Bitcoin Core developers were cooperating with efforts at creating multiple implementations. This is a very good this thread to read for historical reasons. Find it, just read it from top to bottom. Watch the attitudes of the developers change. But early on, Luke Jr. identified a great way to reduce the risk of multiple implementations. You know, as he said, he offered to run bits of proof alongside Bitcoin Core, because uh, uh, Luke Jr. was running the Allegius mining pool. And he even said, after it's proven to be reasonably stable, I even made Allegius refuse to produce block blocks your code rejects as a security measure. This way, somebody can't get Allegius to mine a block attacking bits of proof users. So this offer was made in November of 2012. And um, shortly after this post in the thread, the attitude started to change against multiple implementations and deciding that we needed a monoculture. And that's where we are today. But uh, the reason I wanted to produce this, uh, include this screenshot, is to point out that the answers to these questions have been known for literally four years. This, this is almost a four-year-old comment. The, it wasn't a hard problem to solve. Everyone has known how we can safely get multiple implementations, but the, the debate, you know, 
the reasons other than technical capability and engineering possibilities have been driving it. So that's uh, that's my quick tour of multiple implementations. Um, one point, once you know the scope of the problem, uh, everybody kind of knows what we need to do. Good software engineering practices, just basic risk management techniques. These are not, it's not rocket science, we can do it. So that's all I have. Thank you. Yeah, I have a question. So what turned the tide back at the end of 2012 towards the long implementation? Towards the end of 2012, um, I, I would have to read through the thread. Uh, I, I don't know if it's worth bringing it up right now. Um, I believe it was either Gregory Maxwell or Peter Todd who initially started to uh, introduce skepticism. Because um, at the beginning of the thread, uh, Greg Maxwell and Mike Hearn immediately jumped in with code review and found consensus bugs and bits of proof. And they went back and forth uh, with Tomas about uh, correcting them. They had some debate about the, the philosophy, because there was a debate of should we, you know, should we immediately disclose the failures, or should we just tell you that there's one and see if you can find it on your own to just kind of gauge your capabilities. That was a debate that happened. Um, and th this thread went on for over a month. And by the end of the month, the uh, yeah, it, was one, it was either Peter Todd or Gregory Maxwell started to say, you know, this is too hard, we just shouldn't do it at all, it's too much, it's too dangerous. And after that thread, um, if there's, uh, there's been no cooperation whatsoever, and in fact there's been active attack. You know, um, uh, BTCD was the second um, full stack mining capable implementation. And they were um, they, they were treated very very badly uh, when they when they announced their release in uh, I think it was mid twenty thirteen. So um, I, I'd have to go through the thread to figure to figure out exactly who started you know where the inflection point was. But uh, I, I'd encourage everyone to just look it up and read it for yourselves. Just find the thread, click on all, and go top to bottom. Next question over here. Um, I'm just. Speculating, but um, maybe it should be something that you can comment on. Do you think, from the developer's perspective, say maybe Greg Maxwell or or uh, whoever was working with Bitcoin Core, they were worried about a coordination problem when trying to create new features? That if you have multiple implementations and you want to introduce a new feature, you know, instead of doing it in one implementation, now you have to do it across many, and that that, that would then become impossible. That is that is a uh that is something that's come up before, uh, the idea that it's more difficult. Um, but it's, it, it's kind of hard to separate that idea that it's more difficult from the idea that not everyone may agree, right? So if, if one implementation is the only implementation, then the, uh, the barrier, like if users don't like the features that they're putting out, they have a very high barrier to avoiding it. There's multiple implementations, and not all the authors agree on different features. Um, there's much more choice and you know user ability to switch. So that's the, the it's this you know it, it's a case where somebody can say they have one objection, but it's not necessarily obvious that that's their real motivation. Because honestly, with uh, if there's ten implementations that are actively developed. The ability to implement new features shouldn't be a problem because that's work that happens in parallel with multiple development teams. The real issue would be if there's a feature that some implementations want and others don't, and there's no ability then to force that feature into every client. And uh, you know, depending on your point of view, that's either a good or a bad thing. Thank you. Last question. John. Are there any good examples that you can? Think of off the top of your head of software systems with multiple implementations that are kind of like archetypes for success. Uh, it seems like most protocols. Uh, I mean, HTML, HTML would be a, a bad example of where it's never really been done right or consistently. Uh, TCP is a better example. You know, Microsoft has its own TCP stack. Linux has its TCP stack. BSD has one. There, you know, 
they they speak the same protocol and they uh, you know they get along. Now TCP is vastly simpler to specify than Bitcoin because it doesn't have an embedded scripting language. Um, even even when you come down to protocols like uh, the SATA protocol that you know your motherboard uses to talk to your hard drive, different manufacturers. I'm just wondering if there's any that like the general public has heard of and can kind of wrap their heads around. You know what I mean? Big browser would be made. Like success stories to point to, saying, "Look at this great success story." General, you may have opened this in the Yeah, it's an IP on IMAP. Which is, I thought it was fascinating that you mentioned saying that's not rocket science because actually, you know, having multiple implementations completely separate is rocket science. Like that's just one yeah. of the things that they do. You could literally hire two completely independent teams to build the exact same specified software, and then they run them. You know, on the rocket at the same time, or on the critical thing, and then you know, if they if the they don't agree, you know, hopefully they have a third. I guess that's one other story. There's more a cable protocol, um, one where you did not do dynamically select your bandwidth. All of the vendors went into cable labs and they literally tried to crash each other's. You're talking cable TV. Yeah, but the internet. internet. Oh, okay. oh, oh. So absolutely, they went for multiple implementations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, they they would fight each other. Mm -hmm. you know, everyone would fight against each other. Well, that that's my question. It seems like there's a real risk of there being just a proliferation of multiple implementations of people disagree, which in the Bitcoin community we disagree a lot. So what prevents that from happening and becoming completely unsustainable? There's nothing that prevents it, but it's not a problem. Because um, the software, uh, the operation of the software is really a proxy for the, um, for the wishes of the users. So if, uh, so Bitcoin can't function as money unless all of the humans who agree to, to buy and sell for it uh, accept its properties. So that, that's really the ultimate fallback. Um, if it's not, so let's say there were 25 independent operations and each one only had a tiny share of the network. If those 25 could not agree on a common base feature set, um, it, that's, the, that's the least of your problems because you don't have, uh, you don't have adopters of this form of money. And that's kind of, that's more of a situation where you have like 25 different altcoins that don't interact with each other and, and aren't really functional. So, if the, um, uh, the consensus between the users of the software and the people who choose to honor monetar, monetary value in Bitcoin, that's, um, that is the actual consensus in Bitcoin. It's, the actual consensus is an economic phenomenon, but the software is a model for that. And so the, if the software correctly models that consensus, people use it. If it doesn't, they don't. The consensus doesn't exist, you can't create it with software. So that would be that'd be how I would uh, approach that problem. Does it, I, I guess the, the short answer is if all of the users want a feature and 19 out of 20 uh, software providers of no don't provide the feature, they'll just move to the one that does. So that, that's, that's if, if there is a human consensus, then the software consensus will follow that. In this case, so there is shared state across that has to be preserved. The historical data has to be preserved. Whereas protocols like browsers and so on, you don't really have to really care the browser breaks. The fear we want to agree. Right, it, it is a more difficult problem to solve. That's true. Uh, it's, you know, so, so in this case, in 1920, uh, software providers said we're not going to do this feature, and they don't give you like four extra bytes of block header that has feature was one that would exist. Right, unless if the users really want it, they switch to the one that does, and then you you get a chain fork, and the, the fork that becomes dominant is the one that represents the the will of the majority of users, the economically weighted majority of users. So it happened for them. 
Yeah, yeah. which is kind of why we're, we're all here. <laughs> we're hoping that we can convince the majority of the users that there is a human consensus. And if one or two implementations are the only ones that provide that feature that everybody agrees we should have, then we shouldn't be afraid for it. That's, that's the idea. Um, so with that, uh, thank, thank you, Justice, very much. Thank you.